In this video, a prop trader at our firm shares his journey from SMB intern to consistently profitable trader. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafiori, co-founder of SMB Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic One Good Trade and the playbook. In this video, Justin Spiro from our New York City trading desk shares on campus with the Stony Brook University Investment Club one, his trading process, two, the turning point in his trading career, three, the importance of risk management, perseverance, trading rules, using TraderView to measure your trading performance, focusing on your best trades, and mentoring younger traders. Let's get to work on sharing these important trading lessons from a former SMB intern and now consistently profitable trader so you can grow your trading account. My name is Justin Spiro. I'm a trader at SMB Capital. I've been trading for, well, at the firm for four years. I started my fourth year, so I'm a senior trader. Um, and before that, I was sitting where you guys were in the investment club at Stony Brook. Yeah, so I would like to keep this pretty informal. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and we'll answer them. Uh, so the presentation today, it's pretty much about how I got the job, my journey as a trader, what my day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and I broke it down like the internship, year one, two, three. All right, so how did I get my job as a full-time trader? So I was a business major with a focus in finance, um, also part of the investment club, obviously. My boss and the co-founder of SMB Capital, Mike Bellafiore, he came in to do a presentation. Um, everything he had to say was really, really interesting. I was doing some trading, um, also doing the market view competition like you guys do. I won that a couple times. Um, and after that, one, once he was done, I went up to him, started just talking to him about technical analysis and trading. Um, I got his email a couple weeks later, just shot him an email. Hey, do you have any internship opportunities? Thanks for taking the time to speak with me um, after your presentation. And then before you knew it, I was in my suit and tie going to New York City for that interview and I got the internship. So from there, um, I was interning on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the days that I didn't have class. Um, and I was also working every night at a restaurant, so I had a pretty hectic schedule. Um, and basically it was myself and another intern. The internships look a little bit different these days and I'll talk to you about that later. Uh, and basically what we were doing was we were interning and going to all the meetings. Um, there was a class of new hires. So um, every summer, I think it's summer now, but every fall they would take in like five or six new developing traders. Um, and basically they would go through um, a pretty intense training process, um, probably three, four, or five meetings a day. Um, and as interns, we got to sit in on that, watch them, and sometimes participate with them. So after my first internship, um, I pretty much went up to the manager. He's the risk manager. His name's Carlton. Awesome guy. Um, I said, hey, like, I really enjoyed myself. Could I come back next semester? Uh, I was doing some pretty good work for them, uh, and they were happy to have me back. Basically, my goal was, so that was when I asked to come back, it was spring 2018, my senior year. Um, my goal was obviously to get a job. So I figured, you know, I have to participate a little bit more, try a little harder to stand out, just do everything I can. And of course, when you're the intern at a professional trading firm on Wall Street, and I'm pretty much, you know, just trading some Bitcoin here and there, trading weekly options, um, you know, not that much experience in the markets and everyone's smarter than you. It could be a little nerve wracking, but you know, if you, if you love something, you got to give it 110% effort and step out of your comfort zone and just give it your best shot, really. At the end of the second internship, uh, they, they liked my work. I had a three round interview. So one interview was with a senior trader on the desk, a seven figure trader. 
now I think he's an eight-figure trader. I had an interview with him. We went to a coffee shop down the block. Um, then after that, I had a, a, another interview with a psychologist. His name is Dr. Steenbarger. Um, he's one of our greatest resources at the firm. He is a trading psychologist, performance coach. So I had an interview with him. Uh, and then I had my interview with Mike Bellafiore, the co-founder of SMB. Um, and funny, funny story, actually. I had my interview with Mike, and he's sitting in his office, and I'm like, how could I, you know, like, what could I do to, like, stand out? So I figured, let me write up a presentation on a, on a recent good trade that I saw, and I'll, like, present it to him and, and flip through the slides. So I start to do that and like pretend this is the paper. My hand's like, I was like, shit. Like, I didn't expect that to happen. So I was pretty nervous, but you know, pushed through it and landed the job. But before that, I was waiting two weeks to hear back whether I got the job or not, and I was still doing the internship. So I'm like, I wish they would just tell me already. Like, it was pretty nerve-wracking, but one day I was sitting in the morning meeting and I actually teed up this trade idea. Um, it was a trade in gold, so we don't really trade commodities that much, so I figured that I had a pretty unique idea, um, really well thought out idea. We don't need to go into the details of it. So it was, we were in the morning meeting um, with Carlton, the risk manager, uh, the new hires, Mike was also in the meeting, and they were going around the room sharing morning ideas. I was looking at the manager, Carlton, I was like, pick me, pick me, pick me. And I pitched this idea, really great idea. I remember Carlton was super excited about the idea. He actually like lifted his hands up and was like, yes. Um, and that day I got the job. So that was pretty awesome. If you are a U.S. college student and interested in interning at SMB Capital, please click the link below to apply to our trading firm. We offer internship opportunities only to those who are in college and highly interested in trading. During the internship, you'll be trained by our firm, develop relationships with our traders, gain access to all of our firm resources, compete to gain an offer to be hired by us, and really learn how to trade. Why can't you become the next great trader on the street at SMB and experience all of the rewards that come with that? After I got the job that summer, we did some training programs at home. Um, so one of the courses was called the SMB Foundational Trading Course, where basically um, the course just goes in depth into basic trading principles um, and the firm's pretty much trading beliefs. And then after that, I took the winning trading course. It's called The Winning Trader. Um, and it's basically all the best trades, the best setups, playbooks, we like to call them, that the firm trades. And it goes in depth to each one, so you kind of have an idea or like a selection of different setups that might fit your personality. So when you go to the firm um, and you start trading, you could try those different setups and see what works for you. Um, both of those were pretty intense courses. Um, it was pretty much like taking two summer classes, two college summer classes. So year one as a developing trader, that is my equity curve. Pretty horrible, right? Yeah. It's pretty much straight down. Um, when I started, it was myself and five other guys, and we were trading on a simulator for the first quarter, and basically that was to get us used to the software that we were using. It's a proprietary software. Um, we're the only ones that have it, so get used to that, uh, get used to putting on the trades, and I was crushing it on the simulator. Like Every day I was making almost like 10K, and I figured by the end of my first year, probably going to be driving a Lambo. Um, like you see those guys on Instagram that day trade, they're driving Lamborghinis and stuff like that. It's like, that's going to be me. Like, I'm the next Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, clearly, that didn't happen. You can see the P&L curve straight down. But, you know, during that first year, definitely learned a lot. We were, 
attending a ton of meetings, like I mentioned, um, learning from experienced traders on the desk who were consistently profitable. And basically, I was just trying all different types of trades that might fit my personality. And we were also, something that we do at the end of every day, we input our trades into TraderView. Uh, has anyone ever heard of that before? TraderView? Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, you basically plug in your trades and it gives you a whole list of stats. You could also tag the trade. So I would say, for instance, I was trading a breakout trade on Apple. Um, I would tag that breakout. So each of your tags, uh, it'll have stats for. Um, for instance, win percentage, um, time in the trade, um, average winning trade, average losing trade. That way, when you have enough um, tags, you could really figure out what you were good at. So that's kind of what I was going through um, the first year. Uh, so we went live at the end of December, like I said, tracked our stats, and we made these things called playbooks. Um, so basically what a playbook is, is it's a PowerPoint, um, and you would have slides like bigger picture, what was the market doing? Then you would have fundamentals, uh, what are the fundamentals of the ticker you traded? So like market cap, short interest, institutional ownership, um, average true range, which is the average range that the stock trades in in a single day. Um, so we would look at all those things and then we would um, basically take screenshots of the charts and pretty much put, I would enter here, sell here. You would, you would you'd take the trade and you would edit the slide so it would be like a perfect trade. Like if you traded this stock perfectly, what would it look like? And we made hundreds, hundreds of those just to like engrave it into our head, like what the setup could look like, when it works, how would you trade that? So next time you see it, you're just executing, not really thinking about, oh, what should I do? We're also journaling a lot, something that every really successful trader I know, they, they journal. So at the end of every day, they write down their thoughts, uh, what they did wrong, what they think they could have done better, um, what they did well, how they could expand upon that, um, and you set goals, you write out how you've done on your goals, are you working on your goals, that sort of thing. Um, basically, we were just, it was trading 24-7. Um, I was commuting to Manhattan. It was basically 13-hour days, and it was really tough. It was really tough, and as you can see, with the equity curve here, just imagine every day you're commuting into the city and just losing money and digging yourself into a deeper, deeper hole. Um, so it was really difficult. Uh, I had some of those guys that I started with started quitting because they couldn't make money. They just didn't see their way through it. But me, you know, I, I just loved it so much that I was going to figure out a way. But don't get me wrong, like there were days where I was losing money and I'd go for a walk outside in Manhattan. And I'd be like, I don't know if I could do this. Like I might just walk right back in there and quit. I'd be like calling my mom, be like, hey mom, like I'm ready to quit. Like, I don't know if I could do it. So, you know, I did have a really good support system. Um, everyone was pushing me to continue. I was a little depressed, of course. I, I just think it's a good lesson that if you love something enough, you know, you're, you're definitely going to figure out a way to uh, get through. So just a quick look at what the meetings looked like. So Steve's AM meeting, Steve Spencer, he's one of the co-founders at SMB. He holds a meeting, which is basically 15, 20 minutes. He does a screen share, and he goes over uh, what he's trading for the day, what he's looking at. He'll do like a quick macro view, what's going on with the overall market. Following that meeting, we had a meeting with Carlton, our risk manager. So it would be uh, myself, the rest of the people that I started with, the interns, and sometimes a couple of the junior, senior traders were, would uh, pop in and share their ideas. Mike Bellafiore, he would also be there to listen to our ideas. Uh, he would take notes on us. So it could be a little nerve wracking at times, pitching ideas. After that, we would basically just trade the open. At 11 o'clock, we would have a trader development meeting where each of us would go around, talk about one trade that we took in the morning, um, and get 
feedback and criticism from the risk manager, sometimes a senior trader, uh, sometimes Mike. Then at 12.30, reading the tape session. So anyone familiar with the tape is? So you have a little um, level two, it's called. It's a market maker box. Depth of market, sometimes it's called. You have the bids. Uh, you have the offers. And it shows um, exactly how much size people are bidding in the stock. Um, the offers stack up. You can see how much uh, of the stock people are selling in real time. And then the time in sales shows the actual prints coming through in, in real time. Uh, so following um, that meeting, it was basically we would record our screen, say, you know, Tesla is breaking out over $1,000 a share. You would record your level two, uh, your time in sales, so you would see what that actually looks like. So you have the offers at 1,000, the offers people are selling into 1,000, um, you have the bids stacking up, you see the offers start to decrement. So say there's... Um, 10,000 shares at $1,000. You would see that getting hit. The people on the bid side are taking that. They're buying it, they're buying it. You see a decrement and all of a sudden it shoots through 1,000 and it takes off. So we would have that recorded and we would review that just to get it in our heads. You know, What does it look like when a stock is breaking out over a key resistance area? We would do that. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'd have a playbook meeting where one of us would go over a playbook and get feedback. And then on Mondays and Wednesdays, we had the These Guys Are Good meeting where a consistently profitable senior trader would come in and he would go over his top trades from the day in detail. So we could get a look into you know, what he was thinking when he was trading, um, how he traded a certain stock or a setup. Um, and here's just a quick look at what TraderView looks like. So at the end of the, the day, you plug in your trades and it spits out all these stats. So average winning trade, average losing trade, total in number of trades, um, pretty much everything you need to know. And then you can see on the bottom there, you could sort trades by price and volume, um, instrument that you traded, what was the overall market doing when you were trading that day? You know, was the S&P 500 in the prior day's range, just hanging out in the prior day's range, or was it breaking out and trending? Was the market trending lower? Was it going red on the day when you were trading? How did that affect the individual stocks that you were trading that day? So this is year two. Uh, you can see that things were looking up, finally. And basically how that happened was I had my stats in TraderView and year one I was really diligent with tagging all the different trades I was taking and I was keeping track of those stats very closely. And just like quickly, year one, something I noticed I was doing was I was really, really hard on myself and everything I was doing wrong I was trying to fix. But what I wasn't doing was I wasn't focusing on what I did well. So year two, I kind of had all those stats and I was like, look, I'm trying like 10 different trades here. And there's only about two where I'm doing decent with. So let me forget about all those bad trades I was taking. Let me focus on just these two things, which I think were um, mean reversion trades. So when a stock is, you know, it's up one day, it's up another day, it's up three days, it's up four days in a row. Um, something to keep in mind is for everyone that's trading, stocks are like rubber bands. You can only stretch them so far before they snap back. Um, and what I was doing was once a stock was overextended, um, I would get into a short position and catch that first down move. So I was doing that really well, also trading higher time frame breakouts really well. So I was just doing those two things all year, perfecting those, getting really good at them. Um, also, trading rules are very important. So when you're sitting, well, technically the market's open for us from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. So think about it. If you're sitting at your desk, you could always put on a trade. You could always just hit the button and put on a trade but you can't, a big part of it is being very patient. And I think, you know, something that people don't understand is like trading, a lot of it is just sitting there, 
stalking trades and, and being really patient and waiting till you see the perfect setup to strike. So it's kind of like you're a sniper, right? You got a certain amount of bullets. Um, you wait for the perfect moment and you strike. Uh, so you have to be very patient sometimes. Uh, year two was also about getting risk bumps. So as a new trader, how do you start to make more money? Say every day we have a stop loss. So if we, for instance, say it's $1,000. If we lose $1,000, you're done trading for the day and that's it. Um, but eventually you could bump that up through the risk manager if you're trading well. So what was going on was every time I was net positive for two weeks, I would get my risk bumped by 20%. So two weeks net, net positive, the bump goes 1,000, 1,200. And that keeps happening until you know, the numbers start to get pretty big, so it has to you figure out a different way. So right now, if I make four times my stop in a month, I'll get a risk bump. So joining a team, uh, expanding my network. So your second year trading, you get the option, well, you join a team. Um, led by a senior trader, a top earner on the desk. So I think right now we have five or six teams um, led by seven-figure, eight-figure traders. And you interview for each one of those teams. You figure out which team best fits your personality. The risk manager helps with that a little bit. Um, and eventually you get placed on a team. And that is also, that was also a turning point because you get to work directly with someone who's consistently making money in the markets, um, who's been doing it probably. Most of the senior traders have been trading for at least 10 years, maybe even a little more. Um, and you get to work with them side by side every day, um, learn about what they're doing. So that's also very helpful. And on each team, probably about five, five to 10 traders developing traders, well, not developing, developing traders, second year traders, third year senior traders as well. Expanding the network didn't, didn't stop. So we have something called a blotter on our trading platform and you can see what everyone else is trading at the firm. It's pretty cool. It's like, um, it's like our own like social media, you know, you can see what everyone's doing. So anytime I would see someone trading the same stock that I traded, um, who is doing much better than me or who is trading at a level I wanted to get to, I would reach out to them. And, you know, that's not to say if, you know, if I was making hypothetically $1,000 a day, I saw someone making $5,000 a day, I would speak to them, you know, like, what are you doing? Um, how did you trade this trade? You know, I wasn't making $1,000 a day talking to the guy that was making 100 grand a day because they were just on such a, a further level than I was, kind of like a waste of time. So it's kind of like baby steps, taking baby steps. Um, so reaching out and expanding your trading network is really important. Also on Twitter, there's a pretty tight knit uh, trading community. And um, at the end of this presentation, I'll give you guys my Twitter handle. So if you want, you know, you could follow some of the people I follow and get a look into you know, some of these guys that are making a ton of money. So expanding the network, really important. And second year, talking to the performance coach about once a week. Um, and, you know, he's phenomenal. He, um, he's worked with some of the biggest traders on Wall Street, some legends. Um, and so we're super, super lucky to have him. Uh, so talking to him was very helpful. Also doing monthly reviews at the end of each month. So basically we would have a team meeting the risk manager would be there, Dr. Steenbarger would be there, the boss would be there. We would talk about our month, you know, what did we do well, how could we do better, uh, anything that we were doing wrong, creating solutions to those problems, also um, setting up goals to work on for the following month. Year three, you see the equity curve is looking much better. Uh, so that's this year. So um, from there, once you're consistently profitable, it really comes down to building out your playbook and trying new trades. So I think of every trade as a business. So I started with the backside trades, like I mentioned, the breakout trades, got really good at those, perfected them. 
now I see people, you know, swinging trades. So my average hold time is probably a day or two. But I see people swinging things for a couple weeks and they're killing it. And so that is a new business that I want to develop. But you start that business out small. So the things that you do really well, you size them up. And the things that you're trying to learn or plays that you're trying to develop, you start those off really small so they don't hurt your overall equity curve. And, and that's how you do it. Something else that you start doing once you're a consistently profitable trader is you start joint accounts. So I have a few joint accounts. And what that means is I'll have an account with two or three other traders. And if we all agree on an idea, you could put that trade on in a joint account. Um, and it's a great way to just make a little bit more money um, and communicate uh, about ideas and really take advantage of, of certain trades. Also, options, trading options. So once you are consistently profitable trading equities, the firm allows you to start trading options. And then you could also trade futures as well. So also starting to trade some options in year three. Um, just expanding those trading businesses, we like to call that. Uh, and then just something important is even though you can see doing really well, um, looks like smooth sailing, uh, the, the learning, just it just never stops. There's always someone that's going to be, you know, trading bigger than you, making more money than you. And of course, as traders, we're never satisfied. Um, and you always just want to get to that next level. So, you know, at four o'clock when the bell rings, that's not the end of my day. You know, I'm looking up different option strategies, listening to podcasts, reading books. Um, so it's just kind of like a 24 seven thing really. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so if the trader is also a senior trader like myself, we'll split 50 50 um, because you got to think about it. You know, if you, lose money. So someone that's on their first year doesn't have the same risk tolerance as someone on their third year. So you would have to split that up differently. Um, so for instance, I have a joint account with a younger guy on the desk. He doesn't have the same risk tolerance as me, but to make it worth it, we have to, you know, I have to trade a certain type of size. Um, so, you know, he'll take 30% and I'll take you know, 70%. Um, and yeah, not every day, it is a good day. Sometimes, you know, you, you do your absolute best, you do everything correctly, um, and you still lose money. And it could be difficult. Um, for instance, who knows, who knows about the meme stocks? When AMC was going to like $70, um, I was like, okay, like the backside's coming. I would get some signals that I was gonna drop, short it, and then get my face absolutely ripped off because it would just keep going higher. And you know, that could be pretty tough. And you could see this, this big dip here. That's about like in-state tuition for Stony Brook, maybe a little more. You know, perseverance is a big part of it. You have to come back the next day, sit at your desk, develop a trade plan, talk to your risk manager, say, hey, Carlton, um, yesterday I did X, Y, Z. It didn't work this morning. I'm going to do this differently and I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to sit there and be patient, see where the stock settles and then try this. Uh, and he'll approve that. And you know, you just give it another shot. So yeah, not every day is a good day. Some days are very difficult, but it's all part of the job. It's a very stressful job. But you know, when you're doing well, it's, it's great. When you're doing bad, it sucks. And that's just the nature of the job. Um, but you know, as long as you, trust the process, you know, you're journaling, you're reviewing your trades, um, setting goals for yourself, following your process, you know, things usually will work out for you. And then something I also started doing this year is mentoring other traders and giving back. So, you know, things that I've learned and, and tough lessons that I've learned, I go ahead and I share that with the with the younger traders on the desk. Hey, like don't do what I did. You know, I was my first year I was getting stopped out 
consistently every single day. And the fact of the matter is, just because we have a certain amount of money that we could lose, or we like to call not lose, we like to call it risk, even though we have a certain amount of money we, we could risk every day, it's not, it's not right to hit your stop every day and lose that amount. You're supposed to conserve that risk for really good opportunities. Um, I would say there's once or twice a month where I am willing to go all in on one trade. Um, I would say there's probably five times out of the month where I'm willing to risk 50% of my stop on one trade. Um, and then pretty much the day to day, I'm risking 20% on a average trade. Um, so yeah, something I used to do was just get stopped out every day. Like, oh, that didn't work, let me try this. And that's just not the right thing to do. Um, so you know, that's an example of something that I would teach a younger trader on the desk. Hey, don't do what I did, because it sucks. Also, something I do after the close is Zoom meetings with newer traders. So I'll do a screen share and I'll go over trades um, in, in great detail. So like do like a bar by bar analysis. Hey, I was thinking this. I saw this on the level two in time and sales. So I took the trade here. I knew I was wrong in the trade if it got below here because of X, Y, Z. And by doing that, it actually makes me a better trader because they'll ask questions about things that you know, I, I just haven't thought about in a while. Uh, but, but why did you put your stop there? Um, well, I put my stop there because you know, at that point, the stock was going right on the day. It was also below the volume weighted average price of the day, um, so on and so forth. So that is something that has really helped me trade with my trading. And you know, I just think it's important that you know, you're helping the younger guys on the desk, younger guys and girls on the desk, and passing along all the knowledge. What my day to day looks like starting year four. Um, so 7.30 in the morning, sometimes even a little earlier. So we could see what's called the pre-market trading. So 4 a.m. till 9.30 in the morning. Volume is very light, you know, investment banks and big hedge funds, they can't execute that early because there's no liquidity in the market. But, you know, we could wake up, see where price is gonna open. So sometimes if I have a big, big swing trade on, you know, I'll wake up at four in the morning quick, check where the stock is opening, go back to sleep till six o'clock, wake up again, check it, go back to sleep, wake up again, 7.30, check it. Um, so my day doesn't always start at 7.30, but typically it does. So from 7.30 to eight, we get a ton of research from Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, BTIG, some really great firms on the street, um, read what they're thinking about the market, catch up on news, what's moving, the S&P, the NASDAQ, what happened in Europe, what happened in Asia during their trading day. Just catching up on all the market moving news. Eight to nine, put together a detailed trade plan for the day. You might be wondering what that means, so I kind of written down here what I like to do. So look at stocks that are gapping up. So say a stock had positive earnings and it's gapping up over an important resistance level. Um, I'm gonna take a look at that, see what the news was, see if it could, I think it can continue higher, develop a trade plan. Check on my list of market related names that are setting up for a breakout or breakdown. Basically, I have a list of like 300 stocks Basically what I do is I go look at the daily chart, cycle through them, and you know, after a while, you think 300 stocks is a lot, but after a while, when you look at these charts 24 seven for a couple of years, you can literally just look at them and hit the key. And it's like, it takes 15 minutes. And then follow up on, and this is the most important thing, follow up on stocks that have been in play. Um, and what does in play mean? a stock that has been doing higher than usual volume. And typically stocks that are very popular, they'll continue doing volume and you could mark levels on those stocks. I, th I think if you know Nvidia gets over 300, it's gonna continue higher. So I'll set an alert for 300. Um, if I get that alert during the day, oh, I know it's over 300, type it in. I'm gonna look to get long this stock. So set alerts on stocks that have been in play. Then from 9 to 9.20, I have a team meeting and a Skype call 
with my team. We share our top ideas for the open. Um, the senior trader on my team will just give his overall thoughts on, on the market and what he's looking at for the day, and, and he'll give feedback on our ideas as well. 9.30 to 12, just trading, focus, zoned in, communicating with the team, um, talking to other traders outside the team. You know, if I see someone is trading the same stock as I am, I will chat them on Google. Hey, what are you thinking for this? I think the stock is gonna do X, Y, Z. What about you? Yeah, I agree with that. And then sometimes what's really interesting is, um, you know, if you have a trader who you speak to a lot and, and who you know is a good trader and you both have the same idea, that could give you the confidence from you know, risking 20% of your daily stop on the trade to risking 40%. You know, if the whole firm thinks one, one trade is, is gonna be a great trade, that could give you the extra confidence to put more risk on in the trade. So um, 12 to two, the market is sometimes in what we like to call a midday lull. Um, think about it, what are people at hedge funds and investment banks doing from 12 to 2? Yeah, they're getting lunch and going to meetings. Funny to think about that, right? But you know, they're not executing big trades in the middle of the day. And the big money is really what moves the stock market. Something I actually did my second year where I started getting consistent was I didn't even bother trading from 12 to 2. Pretty much just was patient, caught up on research and emails, and I pretty much, I still do the same thing today, really. So, you know, it's a good time to exercise, good time to get lunch, review your morning trades, check emails, um, start your journal entry, uh, scan for any stocks that are in play that I might have missed, and then um, just communicate with other traders. Hey, what are you looking at for the afternoon? What are you looking at for the close? Two to four, like I said, just, you know, Volume starts coming back in, you're trading and you're focused. And then four to five, depending on the day, I'll either be you know, importing my trades into trade review and journaling, or I'll be mentoring new traders. Um, and then from like five to 5.30, check to see if there's anything moving after the bell. And also that's when I will mentor newer traders. Sometimes the day doesn't stop there, and that's why I have 7.30 written down. Sometimes you get a lot of action in the after hours. Stock will be squeezing higher. Does everyone know what a, what a squeeze is? Squeeze, yeah. So that's when you, know, you have a lot of shorts stuck in a stock, and the stock is moving higher. And as it goes higher, you know, they're wrong. They're getting more and more wrong, and they have to cover their position. And covering is artificial buying, so that could push the stock higher. And in the after hours, sometimes there's not a lot of liquidity because like we said, investment banks, hedge funds, they can't really execute at that time. Um, so that could really get the stock moving um, when, those, when those big players aren't involved. Um, and yeah, so from there, you know, even though the day typically ends at 5.30, I'm still you know, looking at research, thinking of trades for the next day. Um, and then if I'm swinging something, the after hours session closes at 8 p.m. and I'll see how are my swing trades closing. So how to break into the industry. So for SMB, really what they look for, good people first that are gonna fit in with the culture. They look for a track record of success because think about it like college students, you guys aren't gonna have that much trading experience, but if you have a track record of success, whether it's whether it's um, sports, academics, extracurriculars, um, even excelling at your job outside of school, that could, that could be considered a track record of success. And the big thing is you must be taking on some type of risk in the market, whether you know, you're trading $100 worth of Bitcoin or something like that. It's important to be involved in the market somehow. Um, and it could be through options, crypto, futures, stock, anything like that really. Um, but that is a really key thing that you're actually involved in the market. And then just like recruiting and internships at SMB if anyone's interested, junior internships are typically after your sophomore year. So um, 
you know, junior year. And if you, if you stand out, you'll get the opportunity to come back as a senior intern. So it's a little different from when I, when I was interning. The intern classes, you know, when I was interning, it was about two people. Now there are about five to ten interns. And they sit in their own section. They work together. They go to meetings together. So it's a bit different in that way. And at the end of a senior internship, so the people stood out, the people that stood out during their junior internship, they'll get asked to come back as a senior intern. And something that's really cool is they will actually trade firm capital. They'll trade a, a small size trading account. Yeah, and it's a little bit more competitive since there's a bigger amount, uh, uh, more interns. And then, yeah, so we have the email there if you guys have any more questions about recruiting. Uh, and then all the positions are posted at smbcap.com slash careers. Also, they already started recruiting for next summer. So if that's something that you're interested in, you should probably hop on that right away. Let's look at my station at work. There's my email if anyone has any other questions for me. Anything else you guys like to know? Double down on a position? Yeah, that's a good question. So if I'm in a trade and, and it's working really well, um, and I'm in from a really good price, and stock is moving away from my price, and I'm in the money. If I think it's going to continue higher, I'll have no problem doubling down. But something that you never do is you never double down on a losing position. That's how you blow up your account. Unless it's Bitcoin, you just keep buying the dip. Just kidding. We have the Bitcoin ETF that just came out. Also, we have some OTC stocks. ETHE is an OTC stock that follows um, Ethereum. GBTC is a stock that follows Bitcoin, uh, but not exactly. So we do trade those. There are also some Bitcoin miners that we trade, like uh, Riot, R-I-O-T, is a Bitcoin mining company. Um, Mara, M-A-R-A, another Bitcoin miner. So we trade those. and. We're actually in the process of getting access to start trading some altcoins and trading Bitcoin and Ethereum directly. We have access to dark pools. Um, you know, if some of the much bigger traders at the firm want to hide their order, they have the ability to do that. Yeah. That was amazing because, you know, that was my second year of trading and, you know, just, just being in the office during that and hearing, like, the seven figure, eight figure guys, my boss, they're like, we've never seen anything like this. So it was a really exciting time. And, you know, there were some big moves in the market. And that's what really, that's what really set off my trading career because, you know, all my losses from the first year, including fees and all that, I made all that back in like a month. And that was kind of like the turning point in my career. And I just saw how, you know, one or two opportunities could really, could really just change everything. Um, so yeah, I was really excited. Things were, you know, breakdowns were working great, obviously. Um, and there was just, there was a lot of money to be made. And, you know, I've heard on the desk that opportunities like that only come around like once every 10 years, 15 years. So it was definitely an exciting time. Um, I really do wish that I had the experience I do now then, um, but you know, something like that will come around again, hopefully not soon. Yeah, that's a really great, great uh, question. And just, just real quick, I think it's really important for you guys to reach out, you know, attend all the events you could and like just not rely on Stony Brook to like just find you a job exactly. I think that you should be on LinkedIn, like looking up alumni that are working at, say if you're interested in finance that are working at investment banks, reaching out to them, hey, I'm a junior. Um, you know, so doing things like that. Um, and the reason why I chose SMB is because, you know, it, it just seemed like it was kind of meant to be. I started trading real money. Um, I was making money in Bitcoin in 2017. I started trading options. And then, you know, SMB, my boss now, came in to do a presentation. I was like, you know, I didn't really even know that, like, prop trading existed. So that opened up my eyes to it. And I was kind of like, this is awesome. So 
you know, after, after his presentation, after I spoke to him that day, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do to reach out to him and see if they, they did any internships. But, you know, there are, are some other firms on Wall Street and some other firms, you know, pretty much across America that have the same business model. There are a lot of prop firms, different prop firms. No, no, we do have, um, we do have a lot of automation on the desk. So there's a team that does automated trading um, and we have some really great software. Uh, me personally, I never got into the, the coding. Um, yeah, but there are some extremely smart people on the desk that do do stuff like that. Really? Uh, I definitely don't think it's a dying field. Um, I think you just got to look a little bit harder. I just don't see the, I, I just don't see discretionary trading dying out anytime soon. Like I said, we have some guys on the desk that are making over $10 million a year. Like, so, you know, I think that, I think that some of your professors might probably tell you that, you know, day trading is, um, hmm, what's the right word? Maybe impossible to do or gambling, but that's just not the truth at all. Well, we actually have two offices. We have also have an office in Austin, Texas. So I know they do a lot of that over there, but in the New York City office, I would say everyone is using some type of technology and some automation, but I would say actual models that are buying and selling without um, any discretion. There's probably, probably 20% of the people at the office are doing that. First thing is they're not patient and they don't give themselves enough room. So they'll buy a stock and they'll expect the stock to start going up on, on their terms. Just because they buy it, they think it's going to start going up and you know the market doesn't work that way. And once they see themselves losing a little bit of money, you know, they'll get scared and sell. And then when they see it start going up again, they'll buy it. And if it starts dipping down again, they'll sell it, right? So you could see how you fall into a loop of quickly losing money. Um, so I think that a big mistake I see are new traders. They have good ideas, but they have the wrong execution. So having a trade thesis is one thing, but having a trade plan and seeing what you need to see to buy the stock two totally different things. Sometimes when people are buying a stock, they don't have the right trade plan and they don't give it enough room. You have to give it some room to work, right? I'm not going to count trading on the simulator because when you have real money at risk, it's, it's very different psychologically. Um, so I would say maybe uh, slightly over a year, a year and three months. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I do think that anyone could be a com consistently profitable day trader. They just have to love it enough and really put the work and time in. I think that anyone could really do it if they, if they love it. Yeah, we did the market watch thing. Um, I won that one year. We did like a team market watch competition. That was pretty fun. I'm a competitive person, so like I, I wanted to win and I just found that I was way more engaged with the market than I was. You know, I was in class like looking up stocks and stuff like that. Everyone, thanks, thanks so much for uh, coming down.